Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, the conversation today will be in English, hopefully, <laughs> mostly English. And my name is Rana Verbin, and I'm very happy to present Orly Kastelbrum and Nell Zink, our guests. <laughs> um, the f Nell's first book ju was just translated into Hebrew and just came out by Shira Hefer, who's sitting here, Locus. It's called Hakotli in Hebrew, the wall creeper. And uh, her second book, Mislaid, uh, came out about a year ago. Yes. And the third book, Nicotine, is in, in writing October. in October. Along okay. with the fourth book. <laughs> Along with the fourth book. They're coming out at the, <laughs> the third and fourth books are coming out on the same day. Wow. <laughs> Just to avoid confusion. <laughs> Yeah, so just started two years ago and has to... Um, you know, I, I don't have much time left. <laughs> right. And Orly, I think, published 11 books already, started a while ago. Uh, <laughs> a short while ago, at 11. the age of 27, about five, six years ago, it was. <laughs> uh, 30 years ago, 30, 28 to be precise. And just won the Sapir Prize this year for her last novel, the Egyptian <laughs> novel. <laughs> and I think because most of us probably know Oli's writing much better than most of you probably know Nell's writing, we were thinking of starting with a short reading from the book, from The Wall Creeper, and maybe just a page or two. Less than that. Less I than just thought... Um, because I often, there are some people I know here in the audience, and I don't know if they've all read the book, but people often assume because it's in the first person that it might be autobiographical. I assume that, I admit. <laughs> See? So I'm going to read. There is one short passage that is, in fact, autobiographical. So that's what I'm going to read. I woke at six alone, and went downstairs on my bicycle, intending to ride out to the river. It was pitch dark and foggy. I don't know why that surprised me. The year had gotten away from me. Stubbornly, it stayed dark. Whenever the bike stopped moving, the dynamo stopped turning and the light vanished, leaving me blinded from its former glare on the fog. I stood at the spot where a dike had been relocated and saw that everything around me was black. Everything. But I could hear birds, geese, grumbling and complaining like couples fighting over blankets, lapwings elbowing each other, a curlew begging God for blessed sleep. Something big passed over my head in near silence, just a whoosh of feathers. There were no songbirds, just the crypto-human voices of avian insomniacs, and I started to cry uncontrollably. <laughs> That's the only autobiographical scene. Such a shame. <laughs> I was really hoping the entire thing would... No, but really, I think th that's a good point to start with because I think uh, both of you were suspected, and I, I suppose most writers, right, and authors, and maybe women authors in more than men authors, or maybe not, are suspected in writing about uh, their real lives. And, and I think because most of your novels at first were in the first person, everybody probably thought that Dolly City is you. Oh, yes. <laughs> So maybe you they used to call me Dolly, <laughs> <laughs> and it was terrible <laughs> because I'm not Dolly. Uh, people uh, usually uh, um, confuse between the man that who writes the book and the man who is alive, <laughs> read, writing the book, not the novel. Um, I uh, I drank too much whiskey. <laughs> It's okay. We'll just Sorry. We'll excuse the. Um, it is correct to say that um, some of uh, my writing is autobiographic, 
and especially my la last book, uh, in which I wanted to get rid of all that is autobiographic that wasn't uh, written before, and to get, and to start all over again. And now I'm in a point that I have to start all over again, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe go to another place. Yeah, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. But I wanted to um, to ask you then, um, starting at a later age, you know, I mean, st I don't know if you've started writing before you've published or many years before you've published or just started writing for publication? I, I've been writing for a long time, but the first time I finished a novel was in 1998. I was okay. well over 30. I was 34. So and I started happened? short and got longer. So what happened between 1998 and 2014? Well, the, the only writers I knew were very obscure writers, and they told me that there was absolutely no benefit to being published, that, <laughs> that your friends who you could just give the manuscript to by hand, they might read the book, but they would then have to pay for it. So, if, so you would end up giving it to them for free. So basically, you, I decided to skip the middleman and just write and give the novels to my friends. And, and it took some persuading to convince me that it was worth even trying to go to a publishing house. And then you didn't think of going back to your old novels and starting from there? I mean, you, you were willing to just skip and start publishing from the... Well, I had a bad habit of deleting <laughs> novels <laughs> that I didn't want to give to friends. If I didn't write it for some specific person, then it was written just for me, and I would usually f find it not very good, so I w then it would disappear. <laughs> Probably not a bad thing. I don't have any, uh, you know, youthful mistakes I need to suppress. They're, they're already <laughs> suppressed. Oli, did you ever feel like some of your novels, uh, you would have thought of not whether publishing. to publish them? Or, yeah, yeah. I have novels, novels I didn't publish, mm -hmm. about four. Uh, it, it is uh, in the institution of uh, uh, books Abignism. that ba buries, yes, but when you, where you bury your book. It is buried. So you gave Gnazim your four unpublished novels? Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> no, no. I had also another uh, novel that I wrote in 1990 or 1989, but it was erased by itself from the <laughs> computer. 250 pages. Oh, my God. That's horrible. So this explains the energy in Dolly City, the rage. <laughs> After oh, so that, Dolly City came just after that. A minute after it was, uh, because I couldn't uh, bear myself uh, alive without something being written. But you didn't rewrite the novel that was no, erased. You no, just started it was again. dead. It was. I had the second half of it, so I thought I can rewrite the first half, but it was absolutely dead words. Wow. So uh, my ex-husband, who was my husband, mm -hmm. took all the, dis the floppy disks to a <laughs> technician, <laughs> and uh, he couldn't uh, 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 revive, them. revive the text. And I was very angry. I remember I was trembling in the kitchen. Not a good situation for a woman. <laughs> I was trembling in the kitchen, and I felt I have no identity. And I felt that I, it was when I was 30. <laughs> uh, and I felt I need to start something immediately. And I wrote the three first pages of Dolly City. Yeah. And I told myself, you have just finished a short story. You <laughs> exist. <laughs> you exist. So does that ever happen to you? I mean, now that you're in a flow of writing, do you ever erase? <laughs> or erase um, chunks, I mean, large amounts? Of yeah, I tend to be very cavalier about erasing things. I'm used to it. 
I've been doing it all my life. So if I decide some scene, you know, isn't quite what I want, I, I just delete it because I have a certain faith that I can write another one. It, I'm, I'm not afraid of running out of material, not yet. I think not quite. One of the most obvious things, to me at least, when I read your books, I read the, the two that I had, uh, was that it seemed to me that you were that you are language, that you are so fluent, that the language is in your body and you can just do anything you want with it. And uh, which of course made me very envious. And also because maybe, um, we c maybe you can identify with me. I mean, we maybe might feel like that, you know, swimming like that in Hebrew, but English has a thousand years, I guess, or sort, 750 years of English being a spoken, written language? I think, sometimes I think, though it almost sounds politically incorrect to say that in a world of immigrants, that maybe I benefit from my parents having come, my family came mostly from England. I come from a family that was mostly speaking English since English began. <coughs> so my mother had an enormous range of different idioms and figures of speech that she would use, very idiomatic English, not this global English, not writing for translation, but a very American slash British way of speaking that was very oblique and almost impossible to understand if you weren't a member of the family. <laughs> and um, What did they do, your parents? I'm curious. Well, she, she was a librarian <laughs> by trade. <laughs> And my dad just read books obsessively day and night. I've never seen a house with as many books as we had. And you grew up in California, right? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I could probably read before I could talk. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I just, I, I was always a very big reader. Um, I was, my parents encouraged me to read. And I think I, I could read much more than I could say for the longest time, but then it, it just piles up inside and it, maybe at some point it just starts to overflow. I don't know. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. It seems like that. I mean, at some point you feel like you're just, or I, I can suppose that you feel like you, you're just uh, swimming in the language and now you can do whatever you want in it. And which brings me to a question that might irritate the both of you, um, but uh, okay, to <laughs> Daima. <laughs> that was my mom telling me to hold the mic closer. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, so, actually, it was supposed to be the first question. Uh, it was the question of plot, because I feel like maybe not that you do not have plots. You have. Plots, but I f I, when reading you and when you when reading you, I I always feel like maybe that's not the most important thing in your mind. Is it true? You want to start? <laughs> well, I would say Mislaid is a very plotted book. It's like it's like a Shakespearean comedy, or like it's like it's like an operetta. That's how I planned it. But this book, The Wall Creeper, Hakodli, is a book about a personality, it's about a voice. So so the events proceed almost like a picaresque. She just stumbles from one situation to the next until on about, not even the last page, but the last half a page, she takes control of her life. So, you know, that's the happy ending, like the <laughs> a little like whipped cream on top. But um, my books, vary a lot in that way and it, and I've I've been doing on the job training as a writer so so that in my most recent book n nicotine is what it's called nicotine like in cigarettes I feel like I managed to combine the 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 methods I used in both of the earlier novels planning a plot ahead and also just having an action that's passed along from scene to scene to scene to scene so that which is what makes it hard to put down. Um, I, I'm not in control of my technique yet entirely as a novelist, but I'm very glad that people are willing to pay me to keep learning. <laughs> and, yes? 
uh, uh, until the recent, my recent book, including, I tried my best to have a plot in every <laughs> book I write. But lately, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I can only describe, and my the, the book that I'm writing right now is full of descriptions, because I live in such a place for three years that uh, you must d describe it. It's the middle of Tel Aviv, not nicotine, but methadone. <laughs> uh, all the junkies of Tel Aviv comes ev come every day to this place to get their methadone. And even when you go to the supermarket to buy groceries, you have to, to look at them and to meet them. And no, they are very transparent for uh, the rest of the people, but I can see them, and I can see what is going on with them. And I describe it in my book, how all the coffee houses uh, get rid of them, and how did McDonald's, they tear all the, the tables and chairs. Instead of telling them to bid, to bid it, they tore all the chairs, and now they are in coffix. <laughs> but they have problems in sitting there because the chairs are very high and their bodies are already tor uh, tor du tor uh, can. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling always when I when I read your books that um, that you <laughs> I'm obviously reading myself into everything I read. Okay. But I always have a feeling that you start with a feeling, and and uh, that you don't start necessarily with uh, knowing exactly, you know, your end, okay? Which I think maybe some authors do know exactly where they're going when they sit to write a, a novel. But I, I really have a feeling that you start with a strong emotion, and and if you write about that, and then the story, perhaps builds itself around it. Is it, would you say it's true or? Um, I start in the middle. This is what I tell my uh, students in, uh, in Betzel El. Start in the middle and then there is a slow disclosure of what is happening. Wh where are we? And this is suspense. This is tense in the text. This is very good. Um, but now I have this problem of uh, objecting plots. Whenever I write and I feel that a plot is coming, I kill it. And I continue to describe the road, the people, the sound, the color of the, of the uh, uh, service uh, like uh, police and the uh, ambulance. I can, when I sleep, when I see, when I am in my room, I can also feel, I can also hear the bottles sh uh, Clink. touching, clinking each other because the homelessers are looking for bottles and it's, I'm in the middle. And also, uh, I can see a blue light all over my uh, bedroom. It's the police. I can I can now I can identify them by light the the city of Tel Aviv orange the police of the city of Tel Aviv orange and blue the police blue VIP scars blue <laughs> uh, ambulance red <laughs> and I need and I also live not far away from the hospital Ichilov so imagine yourself the sound and and also it's the eastern uh, entrance of Tel Aviv. Well, I think about a million people uh, are crossing my house every morning. A million, at least. It's like living in Tokyo, though I was <laughs> never there. <laughs> I mean, getting away from plot, you know, because plot is not considered 
artistically the highest element in a novel. It's sort of the component of the main component of pulp fiction or of genre fiction. So it might be that you're developing literary ambition. <laughs> and if you keep at it, you know, in another 10 years, you'll be a lyric poet. I don't think so. I I don't think so. I, uh, I, don't think so. I it, it, there was a very uh, well-known uh, Israeli film director who lived on uh, in front of me. His name was David Perlov. Very known, and he and he didn't make films with plot except one or two, but the the main. Uh, of his uh, oeuvre is uh, diaries, our diaries about uh, what's going on. And now, when I live in the same junction, I understand him. I'm, I feel I'm, I'm going into a process called perlovization. <laughs> I'm losing it. I can describe, I, I see details, I hear fractions, but where is the plot? <laughs> so, I tend to lean on the personality of the man who, is, who writes the, this, this description, but I also made him a very fictional, I gave him a very fictional and non-logic uh, uh, origins. So I think I will erase it, <laughs> like you do. No, I hope not. But did you ever think about being a poet, or did you ever write poetry? Well, I, I went through the same uh, process that uh, Pierre Bourdieu describes in his book, uh, The Rules of Art. I can't pronounce French, but Les Règles de l'Art, something like that. <laughs> Where he, he describes these 19th century French writers who all want to be poets, romantic poets, when they're young. Some succeed and become the great symbolists. And others gradually move down the ladder. They go from writing lyric poetry to writing prose poetry to writing short stories to writing novels, which are, is, the novel is a commercial genre. It's a very popular genre. And then right around the time they're 40 and they give up all hope of ever achieving anything as writers, they become journalists. <laughs> so I, I had actually gone through that process, but I was rescued, thank God, and restored to the novelist state. <laughs> but I have written poetry. I, w I won a poetry prize oh. in high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was 17. And then you left the vocation because you felt like you've reached your peak. I started writing arty little prose poems and then began writing short stories, as I said. I moved down. I, I, my ambitions progressively became more and more and more modest. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, okay, to a cut to the second question. <laughs> um, it was the question of immigrating or of living in, a, in an environment, in a language that is not your own. And I know that Orly had a, sh a brief experience with that and I think your experience with that is probably 15 years or so, that's what I've read. It's about 20 years since I lived in the United States. And you've spent the 20 years mostly in Germany, right? Mostly Germany, yeah. Here and then Germany. And could you say how it affected you? I mean, obviously it made well, you <laughs> I'm sure it had many strong effects, probably chiefly on my ego, because, you know, we judge people by how they speak, and especially when you're assessing someone's intelligence, the intelligence of a stranger, you tend to pay attention to their facility with the language. Well, you know, there I was, you know, alone, stranded in Germany, sounding really dumb all the time, <laughs> speaking a language that I, I couldn't speak and think in German at the same time. Um, you know, I, I would tell people, sort of like pleading with them with tears in my eyes, really, if, if in America I'm considered an intelligent person and, <laughs> and, and also a good writer, I swear. <laughs> but I was not necessarily believed. So it's been one of the great gratifications. I cannot tell you how happy it has made me 
to have my uh, work published in Germany and reviewed well, so that all these people who used to, I, uh, you know, dismiss me or kind of treat me like chewing gum that they found on the sole of their foot, now they're, they're sucking up to me. <laughs> What's it? Mitchanefe? Mitchanfim? I love it. <laughs> so, would, but would, so you would say that, on the other hand, it was probably a liberating experience. I mean, to live where nobody knows you and you can just... Uh, or was it a it deteriorating liberating experience? Liberating if, if, if freedom is floating untethered through the void, <laughs> <laughs> then, then I was very free, and and it's true that it may have affected my writing in a very positive way because I didn't have people socializing me to write in a certain way. The way if I if you live in Brooklyn and you're a writer, you're surrounded by other writers reading your stuff and reacting to it. I didn't have that problem. <laughs> Only when we were speaking before. Uh, you told me about, we were talking about the uh, few months, I think, that you've spent in, in, in New York, in, in upstate New York, right? In or Boston. In, ah, in Boston, okay. And, and uh, the one thing that was interesting that I wanted you to talk about here again is, is the uh, observations you've had about the English language and okay. mainly about the, the place of the place. I'll, remi I'll remind you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm there for you. I'm there for you. Okay, <laughs> we were talking about the chapter in, in Seinfeld, in which Seinfeld and uh, Eileen, what's Elaine. her? Elaine. Elaine. <laughs> they they uh, want to uh, make a couple separate so that he will gain her and she will get him. And, and he's telling her what to do. He's giving her a tip after they separate and they are ambushing each one, uh, the, the, the opposite sex. Uh, he tells her, uh, to Eileen, you have to call him and tell him that you are there for him. <laughs> and this is something that happens also in Hebrew. The question of place, where does it meet you? Do you have it in English? Where does it meet where you? Where does it meet you? Uh, something happened to you. I'm looking, let's, I'm talking from a place. Are you talking also from a place? <laughs> <laughs> we in, in Hebrew, we say, I'm talking to you from a place, uh, from a very empathic place. This is very psychological. You know, I think of that in English as a recent phenomenon. Yes, please. So maybe they're picking it up from <laughs> you guys. <laughs> there are too many of you in New York. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's <laughs> no, no, no. We it's, it was translated into Hebrew from although God is a place for us. The other name for God is Amakom. Yes. So in a way, the origins of that thought might be Jewish. No, I, 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 it's all Jewish. I, I didn't, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Amakom Amakom It's the origin is uh, from the Bible. Yes. I mean, <laughs> what's, what's, what's going through my head right now is there, there's a new book that I've already read because I'm a cool literary glitterati insider <laughs> by Jonathan Safran Foyer called H Hineni, like Here I Am. That's the name of his that's book. And English? maybe he, that's, it's called Here I Am. Oh. And maybe he's making a point. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for you. I'm why, always why there are for you. Always since there since for you? We, we, we met on the uh, last uh, day before yesterday, we are sending an SMS <laughs> to each other. I'm, call, I'm telling her, you know, I'm al I always be there for you. <laughs> and she's t telling me in Facebook, in the messenger, I will be there for you. <laughs> there, not to hear, there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go there, you'll find me. Of course, I'm sure. <laughs> It's it's uh, something that is I think it is simplifying the language and it's not a good thing because everybody now psychological psychologists uh, mysticians uh, oscope uh, astrologue everybody is talking from that place <laughs> we, I'm talking to you from a place that etc 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 
it's, it, it's an idiom in Hebrew. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. I wrote about it in 2000 when I uh, first sensed it. People are uh, talking from a place in Israel. I'm sorry. And it's not here. It's there. I wanted to, if we're on the subject of, of uh, idioms and, uh, and, and uh, expressions that uh, maybe separate us from the place we're in, um, I think, you know, in all, I'm sure in all the conversations in the festival, at some point you have to speak about politics, so I, I w this is the midpoint of our conversation, so maybe <laughs> that's the right place to speak about politics, but just a little bit. And so I want to move from place to a uh, situation. Because in, uh, in, in Hebrew, we don't speak about, um, or we hardly speak about uh, uh, the details of the political uh, situation. We, we tend to just term it as the situation, Amatzav, and then you can put everything in it. Uh, occupation, uh, um, government, uh, all kinds of politics. And I, th I realized that, at least in the two books that I've read of yours, and in most of your books, you are never in the situation. I mean, or hardly referring to a situation or a political situation. Is that true? Or I mean, I think when we speak about politics, we never tend to think of them as social politics, but mostly as, um, <laughs> oh God, how to say that in yeah. English? Yeah. Uh, political yeah. politics, right? We have a, we have a, a separation between uh, security matters, and that's politics, and uh, social classes, blacks and whites, uh, and... Uh, uh, gender, and that's less considered politics in an you odd know, way. You know, someday Israel will have a federal system, <laughs> <laughs> and and then issues like that will become matters of national interest. But is Israel, if you think of the United States, it's like how many Israels, well, you know, you could start with 50. <laughs> it's a very, very different uh, perspective you have on politics in the U.S. Uh, when you talk about politics, the first thing you have to do is define your terms, and you can do that for the rest of your life, and never actually start talking about politics. Whereas here, there's a there's a consensus on what the basic situation is as a rule, because all you have to do to see it is open your eyes. But then in the Wall Creeper, you snuck in, or actually it didn't really snuck. It's most of the book, <laughs> right? is about, is that a political situation? I'm not exactly sure how to uh, call the, um, it's because I guess in Israel, everything concerning, um, oh God, Echut Sviva environment yeah. is not political at all, or it's not even in the politics, and if it's discussed at all, then it's disgust, not disgust. I think countries that are superficially similar, you know, just you, you go to a new country and they have the same doorknobs you're used to and you think, oh, this place is like home. But um, the European Union is run in a very strange, undemocratic way. Many things that happen there are not <coughs> under the control of anyone, politically speaking. There's an enormous bureaucracy it writes the laws, it drafts the laws, and the parliament can only do one thing, which is rubber stamp it or refuse to rubber stamp it. That's all that happens. It has the same political structure as a, a small town mayor and his city council of, of part-timers who meet two hours a month. That's how the EU works. So, so the directives that are written in this bureaucracy will be handed out to the member countries and they are under, this is unbelievably boring. It's actually a fact that um, they know from you, media research that if you mention the European Union on TV, people will change the channel. So, <laughs> so <laughs> don't mention it. But, but that 
uh, political reality is something I wanted to talk about very directly in The Wall Creeper, simply because when on, on a local level, when you're fighting for an environmental cause, the EU is your best friend. Those EU direct directives, like the birds directive, the water framework directive, they're, they're the only weapons you have. You grow to love them. But then, would you say that the book was embraced by activists, and or is it considered an activistic uh, book? It it wasn't written for activists. It was written for people who would like to read the sex diary of a young, beautiful nymphomaniac, <laughs> so that they will be exposed to environmental themes <laughs> against <laughs> their will. Which brings me to the Egyptian novel. <laughs> it's not about environment, but it is about um, a social political, uh, I mean, yes, it has a social political issue that you're dealing with, and it's uh, like a little bomb inside your book. And I was wondering if, uh, if those were even responses that you received from audiences who read it, or? Ron um, Kachlili <coughs> approached you about it? No. No? No. Surprised? Okay. I just want to say that because of the situation in Israel, I can observe another situation in the language. This is what I can do. I cannot do anything with this situation. I was six years old when the Six Days War happened. So <laughs> I live uh, all my life with, that, with this uh, question mark. And it was a question in the, in the main uh, exams in Hebrew. Would you give those territories away or would you keep it? Really? Yes. What, 1978. Wow. So I just want to say that something that I, uh, something that I found out that the more the situation is deteriorating, the more the language adv uh, uh, invents new superlatives. And, um, and it's amazing. I'm exploring it also, not only that junction where I live. All this new superlative, uh, not only Madhim, which is a, a Madhim uniform, uh, <laughs> like you don't you don't uh, pronounce the uh, madim, uh, madim and all sorts of blessing once in hebrew there were not all those kind of blessing like good morning have a good day have a good week have a good month have a, uh, let i pray for you that the, the rest of the day will be okay something em shekh yom naim what the hell is going on here? And I think it began, it began in, in, in uh, the Gulf War. And after that, it became the norma in the first intifada. We wish you all a quiet, a quiet evening. A quiet evening, it is a superlative. There is an old program in a main radio in Israel, Galal Galatz, Gal Galatz. Pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, weekend, Such and people life. tell them each other now. Um, calm weekend, maybe. Uh, calm. It's, it's called calm weekend. Yes. yes. No, have a have a good weekend. Have a nice, have, have a makasum <laughs> wind, <laughs> and all Chant. kind of, of of words. And another thing happened during the eighties, and this is not literature. This is anthro anthropology. The, the question of the hug. Once we didn't use to hug each other. In the 80s, in the 70s. Oh, the if you don't feel bad. Yeah. Do you it's want okay. This? Yeah. Can I hug you? Can I hug you? I need a hug. All those hug things. This is illegal in Israel. What are you doing? Now you see two boys. Not a homo uh, homosexual. I'm um, hugging. It is also a norm between they boys. Might, they might be Pashto. <laughs> no, this idiom, the Sofoshil Yom, 
it's <laughs> translated from English. Yes, yeah. but we have many like that. Everybody talks today at the end of the day and from the outside of the So you understand Hebrew? From the outside of the day. So we could have had the entire conversation in Hebrew. Outside of us. Yeah. Um, so, but I do have to... Um, gender. To gender. To, yeah, to gender. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't not refer to uh, the opening with the anal sex scene, which was, I think, um, in the Wall Creeper, uh, which was, uh, I don't know, Madhim, <laughs> Kasum, Mikhuts la Kufsa. la Kufsa. <laughs> and uh, very uh, liberating <laughs> um, to read. I, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're being asked about it constantly. So at first I thought, I'm, I'm not going to ask about it. And then I said, yeah, but I can't not ask about it. So um, actually, my, I'm most curious to know if, if women approach you and, and say, I had my husband read this just so he knows exactly what it feels like. Every so often, someone will say something very vague, like, you know, I, I really liked that scene. I'm glad you wrote it. But no one goes into detail, which is fine with me. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I think, okay, I, I don't, also don't feel now like I want to go into detail. At first I thought I wanted to go into detail. Just, <laughs> okay, if my mom says that. I mean, I, I, I could go into detail, but it would embarrass even me. So, no, I mean about, about anal sex as a literary trope. Like, forget the sex, and just think of it, the role that, it, that I see it coming to play in many books I open up. It, it's a, a step in intimacy. It's like people grow closer, so they have anal sex. Like, <laughs> okay, um, you know, not uh, so. You know, so that's what I was reacting against. I think the most interesting uh, uh, thing in that aspect for me was that your woman was uh, was strong inside and so weak outside. I thought, but then also kind of strong outside. And so weak inside. So I think I think she was uh, uh, moving between being zoremet completely, you know, like she flows throughout the book, and uh, and just goes with experiences, goes with men. Uh, that's a, I mean, that's probably an experience most people have had in bed, where things aren't going well. You're having sex. It's terrible. Well, you, but you want to keep trying, and you know if you just say, oh, by the way, this is awful, it's going to be over immediately, and then there you'll be. So you keep trying and experimenting and moving around and make me doing dif different things, and it's still not working. And then afterwards you think, what did I just do? That was no fun. But the entire time you were tr simply trying to invoke a good experience that never happened. So it's a strange position to be in and that it can happen sometimes with the people you're closest to in the world. It's, I mean, th these kind of contradictory situations are what you need when you're writing fiction to make it interesting. Situations that are open-ended and confusing no matter what you do to them. They just stay that way. Which brings me to Dolly City again. I have to, because I just recently, uh, two or three months ago, I read it out loud. Oh no, I mean, I read it, but I, I don't know how to... Experience. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, traumatic experience. I read it for an, as an audiobook, and I was the reader of the audiobook. It's, an, it's a book from 1992. Um, and um, I remember reading it as a, as a young girl, that I, you know, as a teenager and not understanding most of it. And, and mainly I didn't understand uh, what Dolly City was for the, for the main, for the uh, 
heroin, <laughs> heroin for the methadone. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and only when I read it out loud and had to be her, because it's, fir it's a go <laughs> uh, I understood, perhaps uh, stupidly, it took me so many years, that Dolly City was her <coughs> insanity. Why did I understand that? Because there is a part where her sister comes in and she tells her sister, what are you doing here? Are you out of your mind? And then I realized that when you're out of your mind, you're in Dolly City. I think so. I think you're right. Um, Dolly is, a, they, as they say in Hebrew, a city and a mother. Ir ve'em. Ir ve'em b'Yisrael. Dolly City is Ir ve'em b'Yisrael. Listen, it was not uh, fun writing this book, but uh, uh, when I finished it, after the other one was erased, I, w I left it at home for about nine months and there was another war. You know, wars here are like a big, now it's almost every year. Every two years. Two years, yes. Um, I left it and I wrote uh, immediately a, a a book of uh, recipes. recipes, but the recipes were not good recipes for eating, <laughs> like like filet without any confidence, <laughs> an unsecure filet, <laughs> an apple uh, with a, cr uh, a craving for uh, heroin, <laughs> uh, water, how to make water, because today, <laughs> today, in Israel, like you have all the superiorities, the new superlatives, you have also an inflation in uh, 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 cooking uh, programs on TV. And we are talking about it like it's God uh, will that we will deal with it. <laughs> and I wrote a book with a short recipes, uh, and now I found I found it again, and. Uh, Maybe me and a, and a friend of mine will do a program about it. <laughs> we are working on it. This sounds very good. Yeah, water, especially. Water, you take water from uh, a fountain, yeah. water from here, water from, I don't know what to say, I don't want to say. You mingle with them and you, you add a little bit of lemon. <laughs> and a dash of water. Water, yes. You know, they make a scene out of everything today. Okay, of, my, my of, first my yes. first question would, was actually if, if writing Dolly City was an empowering uh, uh, situation, <laughs> and if you know, and then now I have the answer, so I think I know. And also, we only have eight minutes left, and I promised the audience to be able to ask questions, but I do have one last question at least. I mean, I have four, but I'll just pick one because I really wanted to talk to you. It's, it was Oli's question actually, she brought it up and I thought it was an, a very interesting question about uh, uh, having a, a role or a p position, tafkid, in a person's life and how, it, um, how you become identified with your position, whether it's your position as an intellectual or your position as an author or your position as a radical. <coughs> And or whatever position it is, I'm not. I'm, I'm less sure about your position. I kind of have a little anecdote I can tell about that, which was when when my first novel came out in New York. It um, the writer Jonathan Franson helped me launch it. Like he came along to the bookstore to interview me and say, "Here, look, here's Nell. Here's her book," and he's very famous and um, has seen a lot of writers at the launch of their first book. And so we're riding downtown in a taxi, and he said, Nell, you seem awfully calm and relaxed for someone who's about to go on stage and do the first reading she's ever done. You know, why is this? And I said, well, that's not surprising to me, because this is actually the first time in my life I've been 
doing something that where I wasn't completely faking it. <laughs> I mean, really, like, you know, get, getting a rave review in the New York Times, it makes sense to me in a way that working as a secretary does not make sense to me at all. So, so I, I feel like I have a role for the first time ever, and it's very, very reassuring and comforting. Like, right now I'm on stage in front of a bunch of people, but all I have to do is be Nell Zink the writer, and coincidentally, that's who I am, Nell Zink the writer. So it's so easy compared to, it's a social situation that's like the easiest thing in the world compared to everything else I've ever had to do. <laughs> Uh, it took me about 25, 30 years to understand that I'm a writer and to believe it. Uh, I always underestimate myself, but, uh, but I do it for the sake of literature. I want to be an underdog. I want to remain an underdog, even though I have success. I forget, when I, when I come and write to write, I forget about everything. There is only me that exists in the paper or the computer. I don't think I am somebody, you know. And also, I don't think I'm somebody wh when I'm Zoremet in uh, Tel Aviv streets. <laughs> uh, I, I, life is uh, um, hard enough for me, so I will not, that I will never feel uh, arrogance or arrogant as a writer, or and I cannot identify with it 100%. A complex. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you uh, how it is, just a second, it's Spansak Nasa's paper. <laughs> it's, you know what Spansak Nasa, it's taxes, <laughs> taxes. <laughs> Is the human uh, necessity of having a, ho a home, a country, uh, an ident a geographical identity is a burden or an advantage? <laughs> the fact that you uh, are like a swift, maybe, uh, that you uh, travel all over and you move from a sea, you're, you left your own place. Well, in comparison to us, maybe, because she moved to another place. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a hard question to answer because, well, partly because it makes me think of a song on exactly this topic that I really like that happens to be in German, so <laughs> a Schubert lead. But um, now you have to sing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's called Wandre, Der Wanderer an den Mond. Ich auf der Erde am Himmel, du, wir wandern beide, grüß dich zu. Ich ernst und trüb, du mild und rein, was mag der Unterschied wohl sein? Ich wandre fremd von Land zu Land, so heimatlos, so unbekannt. Berg auf, Berg auf, Wald ein, Wald aus, doch bin ich nirgends auch zu Haus. Du. No, 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 the best part is this part. Du, du aber wanderst auf und ab von Osten, zwiegen bestens Grab. Land, Berg auf, Land ein, Wald aus. <laughs> okay, this is the really good line. Da Himmel and Los Haus gespannt ist dein geliebtes Heimatland. So the the endless sky is your beloved homeland, and he's, he's t this is uh, the song is called the Hiker talking to the Moon saying, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I have to cross borders all the time. They're always stopping me at checkpoints, which were a new thing in Germany in the 1830s, 40s. Um, 
and and you're the moon you just move and you have the entire sky and you're free and you just envies the moon and I I think it's quite true that a place where you are tolerated, where you're allowed to stay, where they just say to you, oh, by the, like when you're a citizen, or you have a green card or something, they say, oh, by the way, you know, you can stay here until you get it right. You don't have to fulfill conditions to stay in this country. You're, you're okay here. It's an unbelievably good feeling. And you, it's something, of course, you take for granted when you're a citizen and in, in, in your home country. And when you happen to be somewhere else and getting these letters like, oh, by the way, you know, your salary is too small, you need to leave. It, it's terrifying. It's like this existential terror they try to beat you over the head with. And, um, you know, I'm yeah. glad I'm over it. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad I got a green card in Germany, but it's, it's uh, sorry about the song. <laughs> it's beautiful. And you're also a singer. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you all. <laughs> we have to, uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, I think we are living in a place of uh, existential terror, so I think that's a good place to stop, <laughs> right? And I hope it meets you in a good place. And uh, thank you all very much. And <laughs> have a good and check him.